yes um we will be doing the doctrine of redemption and sanctification today uh, this is like a follow up after having done the doctrine of salvation and regeneration so um in the moment of salvation we are regenerated we are born again into a new creation and along with that comes a whole set of privileges because now we have been born into the kingdom of god so once we have made our entry into the kingdom of god along with that we gain a whole lot of divine privileges and we gain spiritual blessings which we did not have earlier so in that context we are also granted redemption and sanctification so we will be looking at these two concepts in greater detail today so just to get started on the doctrine of redemption um if um, we could have someone read out from the book of revelation revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10 revelation 5 9 and 10 revelation 5 9 and 10 and they sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to god by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our god and we shall reign on the earth it says over here that jesus christ has purchased people from every tribe from every language from every people group and nation so it talks about how he had to purchase them with his blood why why was it necessary for him to purchase people with his blood and we are kind of familiar with this but you know let's look through uh, you know the the background in greater detail so that we have a clarity of what we mean when we talk about jesus purchasing us with his blood okay so as we all know um adam and eve they were under what law were they, were they under the mosaic law the law of moses did not exist at that time adam and eve under were under the law of god himself and in fact the lord had only one law for them of course they had there were positive laws in the sense they were meant to take care of the garden they were meant to uh, you know uh, attend to the uh, creatures that had been created on their behalf they had all of those laws but when it came to you know restrictions uh, there was only one law they were not supposed to eat of that tree uh, you know the fruit of that particular tree of knowledge um, so um, they were under the law of god and when they broke that law of god basically two things happened you know as we know one first is uh, they were spirit beings who were connected to the to god and so they were spiritually alive because they were connected to him but they lost their connection with him they were separated from him when they broke his law and so in that sense they became dead spiritually and when they did that satan was able to take advantage of them as long as they were completely under the covering of god uh, satan could not have any kind of control over them he is like a gangster a bully so he had no chance to come anywhere near them as long as they were under the covering of god but now that they have separated themselves from god now the bully can attack now he can take advantage of them so they kind of exposed themselves to the work of the evil one which is what we see described in our ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 if we come and read out for us ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 One and two, and you he made alive who were dead in trace, trace passes and sins, in which you once walked according to the curse of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. In these two verses, we see these uh, two aspects that we touched upon. We see that they were dead. okay spiritually dead all people uh, because of what adam and eve de- did they were born spiritually dead in their transgressions and sins and another thing that we notice about these spiritually dead people is that uh, the 
the ruler of the kingdom of the air, which is basically uh, the devil, uh, he is at work in, the, in them. He can interfere in their lives. He can take advantage of them. So uh, we see these two factors operating in all human beings. So in that sense, they seem to have become slaves. Um, God did not formally turn them over to the bully and say, OK, now you can have them. No. But they chose to come out of the covering of God's protection. And uh, they were separated from God because they were now lawbreakers who had broken his law. So when they were separated from him, then Satan was able to take advantage of them, take control of them, uh, because they are now in this exposed condition. OK, so uh, it, it's not like as if legally uh, Satan was given any authority. He grabbed it. He took hold of the authority because now he was in a position to attack. He was in a position to take over. So um, if we look later on, much later, uh, God decides to give his written law to Moses. So the written law is given to Moses and the Israelites are asked to follow this law. So the Israelites, as they continue down the generations, which law are they breaking now? They are breaking the law of Moses. That's the law which is getting broken. But what about all the other nations around them who have not been given the law of Moses? They too are breaking the law of God and they are the break, breaking the law which is just written on their hearts. All human beings are programmed with these basic moral absolutes. They all know that certain things are wrong and that certain things are right. So the rest of the nations may not have been breaking the law of Moses, but they are still law breakers. Why? Because they are breaking uh, the, the law which God has written out in their hearts. This is basically what is explained in Romans chapter 2, verses 12 to 15. So if we could have someone read out Romans chapter 2, 12 to 15, it talks about the two categories of people, the Jewish people and the Gentile people, and the way in which each of them is breaking the law. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts, accusing or else excusing them. All right, so it very clearly explains over here that the Jewish people are lawbreakers of the Mosaic law. On the other hand, the rest of the Gentile you know, uh, peoples, they also are lawbreakers. They are not breaking the Mosaic law, but they are breaking the law which God has programmed into, into their hearts, the law which is written in their hearts. The, even though they know it is good, they are breaking it. So in this sense, all the, all the people groups of the world, whether they are Jewish people or whether they are Gentiles, all of them are now exposed to Satan and his work. So they are now under the work, working of the ruler of the prince of the uh, ruler of the uh, kingdom of the air. Okay, so in the uh, so everyone has now come under the control of of Satan. So in their heart, in their spirit, they are slaves of sin. Sin is making them sin and they have no control. Some of them are able to resist to some extent, but nobody is able to keep the law of God perfectly because they have become slaves of sin. They are enslaved in their, in their, uh, you know, in their spirit. And moreover, they, have, uh, they are being controlled by Satan. So it's basically sin and Satan which have gained control over them because of their separation from God. So in that sense, these people are all slaves. So what Jesus does is he sheds his blood. And like we saw in the Revelation passage, he has now purchased all of these slaves in the sense he is trying to set them free from the sinful nature which has been controlling them so far. And plus, he's also trying to uh, save them from this control of Satan, which has, you know, uh, you know, come upon their lives. So Jesus is purchasing these people. 
So if we were to take this example a little further and you know we were to think about Jesus Christ shedding his blood, making the payment of blood to buy the people, whom is he making this payment to? Is he making the payment to Satan or is he making this payment to God? Who is actually the legal owner of the human beings? God is the creator. All human beings belong to God. And God gave them his law. And Adam and Eve broke that law. So Adam and Eve chose to separate themselves from the Lord. But legally speaking, human beings still belong to God, isn't it? They never ever were legally belonging to Satan. Satan took advantage. He was the gangster waiting in the sidelines. And the minute he could get, gain control, he gained control. But he was never the legal owner of the human race. And so, you see, uh, when, when, Jesus, when it says that Jesus purchased, when it talks about Jesus paying the ransom, the ransom was paid to God. Because God is the one under whose anger and judgment the human race is now living. It is God who, uh, who, has, been, uh, uh, who has been betrayed, you know, in, the sense, in that sense. Uh, the, God trusted Adam and Eve. Uh, but instead of you know being loyal to him, they chose to rebel against him. So it's basically God who is angry. It is God who wants to bring judgment. And at the same time, of course, it's beautiful. The beautiful thing is that God is also the one who wants to save. So he has sent his son to be able to achieve that. So Jesus pays the ransom to God. And that is why you know uh, it talks about um, uh, it refers to what he did as the atoning sacrifice. And those of you who are reading NKJV, you would uh, see the word propitiation. That's basically God. Uh, that's basically Jesus Christ atoning for what has been done. He has he he has is making the payment and saying, uh, God, you have been angry with the human race, but now I have taken that anger and that judgment upon myself, and so with my blood. You know, I am now purchasing these people so that they can be set free from the control of uh, sin and Satan. So um, Jesus has paid the ransom to God. And therefore now God is no longer angry with those people who come under the covering of this blood. There are many people who may choose not to make that choice. You know, they say, no, you know, we, we, we don't need Jesus Christ. We can manage on our own. So the blood of Christ, even though it has been shed even for such people, it will not apply to them because they do not, they do, they do not want that free gift. It's a free gift. You have to choose. So there are people who do not make that choice. But for everyone who makes this choice to accept the free gift of the shed blood, all such people, God is now at peace with them because uh, his um, the judgment uh, which was supposed to come on the people has been atoned for. The payment has been done. It, so uh, when, we are, when we are talking about this word redemption, we are thinking about all of these aspects. Okay, So um, uh, it's good for us to understand what we mean when we talk about us being a redeemed people. These are the um, background factors to keep in mind when we talk about being redeemed. We have now been redeemed from the control of sin, from the, from, from the working of Satan, and we are no longer under the wrath of God. We are no longer separated from God. God is at peace with us because Jesus Christ has paid the ransom to him by shedding his own blood. And now God, uh, his anger has been unleashed upon Jesus so now it's he's no longer angry with us. These are all the uh, the spiritual dimensions involved in the redemptive uh, act of Jesus Christ. So coming more specifically to some you know very specific points which are mentioned in your notes, um, I have not taken them in the same order, but just to touch upon those things. So we are very very specifically um, redeemed from the law. And uh, if, if maybe we could read out a couple of verses which talk about that. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, if someone could read out. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Okay, so it says here that we were redeemed 
from under the law. I thought we were redeemed from sin and from Satan. So why is the law poking its nose in over here? What is it? What is it saying over here? You see, uh, the law declared that once our law, the, the, the law of God is broken and we no longer are following the law, but we are rebelling against the law, then the anger of God, the judgment of God is upon us. That's basically what the law declares. The law declares if a person breaks even one single law of God, even one single time, then automatically they are under the judgment of God. That is the declaration which the law makes. The law is a good thing. The law is a godly and holy thing. And the law declares even if a person breaks one single law of God, even one single time, automatically they are under the judgment of God. So in fact, the entire human race came under that judgment. And so we all were literally under judgment, no hope, no future, no uh, hope of any kind of rescue. And then Jesus Christ steps in and he rescues us from under that declaration which law has made. So you see, uh, in that sense, we are redeemed from under the law. The law had declared that we are now under the judgment of God. And we were um, redeemed from that declaration, from that judgment which the law had passed against us. So we were redeemed from that. And then um, uh, if we can also look at Galatians 3.13, which talks about something very similar. Galatians 3.13. Yeah, uh, so um, here it says that we are not just redeemed from under the law. It also says that we are redeemed from the curse of the law. So that's basically what we were we, we looked at just now. The judgment which the law has passed against the human race, that is basically like a curse. Uh, because uh, the law has declared that even if one single law is broken even one single time, then... The curse comes upon them. What is the curse? The curse is that now you are separated from God and his anger is upon you. There is no hope for you. There is no future. So it's the, the law, the judgment which the law has passed is actually almost like a curse which has come upon the people who have you know, broken the law. And so Jesus Christ hangs there on that tree because you know all crosses were made out of wood, out of trees, uh, which is why they say, he who is hung on a tree. So they would take a tree, they would chop off the branches, they would just use the main trunk and they would use that for the cross. So Jesus Christ was hung on that tree and even as he was hanging over there, all of this anger and judgment which has been declared by the law, all of these curses which the law has spoken upon the lawbreakers, all of that was released upon Jesus Christ. He became the curse. We should have been hanging there. That should have happened to us. But rather the curse comes upon him. So we have been redeemed from under the law. And we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. And so over here, uh, the word that is used in, in these verses is that uh, Greek word. Um, exagorazo. Okay, so uh, when we looked at the Revelation passage, the basic word, the basic word for, you know, uh, ransom, that would be agorazo. Okay, so agorazo is the Greek word, A-G-O-R-A-Z-O. Agorazo is the basic word which talks about something being purchased. So in Revelation 5, we saw that it, Jesus Christ purchased us with his blood. He agorazo us. So agorazo is a basically a, a shopping term. So when you go to the mall and you buy yourself a new t-shirt, you're basically agorazoing the t-shirt. You are purchasing it. It's something that you are purchasing. But sometimes this word was also used in a deeper sense. It's not just you buying a commodity or a product. You are actually buying, um, buying, buying back something which belonged to you. So in that sense, something is being redeemed, for instance. 
for some unknown reason, let us say the people at the mall, they have taken hold of your T-shirt. Okay, now they're saying they're, they're holding it. Now you want to buy that back. So you're not just simply going to the mall to buy a new T-shirt. You are redeeming the T-shirt which they have taken control of. So then in, in a deeper sense, agorazo is also used. And so just to make that more clear, they kind of came up with this extra Greek word, which would be exagorazo. Okay, so um, these are all just the, you know, the final details regarding the Greek. And I don't know much Greek anyway. So, uh, so over here, the 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 in the sense that is being brought out is you're not just purchasing something; you're purchasing back. You're redeeming. You're taking back what once belonged to you. So the human race was uh, God's children. They were part of His family. Uh, is what He had originally wanted for Adam and Eve. So now He's buying them back to himself in that sense. So um, so that term exagorazo is used over here in both of these verses, Galatians 4 and Galatians 3. Um, so what exactly have we been bought back for? You know, uh, what has been achieved through this buying back? Uh, if we could read out Romans chapter 5, verse 11. Um, And not, and not only that what we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Yes, it says over here, um, we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So what have we received? When Jesus Christ purchased us, when we were bought back, what did he buy us back for? He bought us back for this thing called reconciliation. The Greek word that is used for that is um, katalage or however on earth you pronounce that. It's there in your notes. I'm pretty sure it's there in your notes. Uh, so that basically that word uh, is saying, um, it, it, again, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of um, what uh, mercantile term. So it's talking about uh, money changers who would basically use this word. Let's uh, use the example, let us say, of people who you know who would come from all over the world on pilgrimage to Jerusalem year after year. So you would have these people who have you know settled down in Babylon, who have settled down in Egypt. They never came back when 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 the exiles returned back. They didn't return back with the exiles. They continued living in those places, but. Once a year, at least, they will make sure that they come to Jerusalem, to the temple, and make their offerings because they are still following Yahweh. Their commitment is still towards Yahweh. So at least once a year, they would come from all of these other places to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices. So when they come over here from another place, the coins in their hand are the currency of another nation. You know, the currency the, which is used in those areas is the currency they would be holding in their hands. But the currency which is being used over here in Jerusalem right now would be the Roman coins, the Roman currency. So they would basically go to the money money exchange guy and the money, the money changer, you know, he would take this foreign currency from them and he would give, give them an equivalent amount. Whatever you have in the Roman currency of Jerusalem, he would give them the equivalent amount. We do that right even today. I mean, you, you want to go abroad, you know, you want to go to Japan. So, you know, you would exchange your rupees, you know, and you would get an equal amount of the uh, Japanese currency. An equivalent amount would be given to you. That is basically your katalage, where there is an exchange of equivalent values. Uh, so, um, what, Jesus, uh, what Jesus Christ has done for us is, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So um, Jesus Christ paid, you know, uh, by taking upon himself the anger of God, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, all that was released upon him. And in exchange, the, the favor of God, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the accept acceptance of God, which was there upon him earlier, that he gave it to us. It was, it was, like, a, it was like an exchange. He took the anger which we should get 
and uh, we were given the favor which he had so there was a kind of reconciliation there was a katalage process which took place because of what jesus christ did for us so now no longer is god's anger upon us it was put upon him and the favor of god which was upon him was given to us we were able to become partakers of the favor of god and the peace of god is now with us god is no longer against us so um so we see that in um romans um okay let's look at another term that is used you know for um redemption if someone could read out colossians chapter 1 13 and 14 colossians 1 13 and 14 he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed in as into the kingdom of the son of his love and in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins okay so over here um the word used over here for redemption is um another complicated word apolutrosis okay so um now this word has a slightly different meaning um you know you're not just redeeming something after having purchased it you are now releasing it you are setting it free in that sense so let us say you see a bunch of pigeons in a in a cage uh, a dows in a cage somewhere no one would buy pigeons they're all over the place anyway so let us say dows okay some there's some dows and you want to release them so you purchase them after having purchased them what do you do you know you go out to the park and you release them so uh, what you are actually doing would be apolutrosis so this is what jesus christ did for us he took us from this dominion of darkness where we, we were stuck we were slaves of sin and we were stuck in the in the in the kingdom of satan you know in the dominion of darkness so jesus christ he he purchases uh, us out of that kingdom and he releases us, us into a new kingdom into the kingdom of the sun you know where we will have new rights new privileges and entirely new uh, way of life uh, so uh, so apollo apollo process happened for us when we were transferred we were set free from one terrible kingdom and we were released to be free you know into another kingdom the kingdom of the sun um let's look at another word for uh, redemption um which is also actually derived from the same lutro uh, you know lutrosis uh, root word uh, so if we could read out first peter 1 18 and 19 first peter 1 18 and 19 yeah yeah so here it says you were redeemed from the empty way of life so we were redeemed from the dominion of darkness and we were released into the kingdom of the sun why so that we will not continue having that old lifestyle that empty way of life which we led when we were in the dominion of darkness that should no longer be our lifestyle because you know this word lutro is talking about being released being set free so we were purchased from one kingdom and released into another kingdom not just for us to be over here but also to get away from the old way of life so not uh, so over here we see that it says you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors generation after generation had been living in sin had been living uh, in a way which will lead to no destination it's empty a way of life in the sense it doesn't result in any reward it doesn't lead to any uh, you know any, any fruit it's just an empty meaningless way of life you just end up losing all your days you end up uh, you know wasting all of your energy on something which has no eternal results and you gain nothing at the end of it so it's an empty way of life 
So Jesus Christ has not only brought us out of that dominion of darkness, he has now released us into the kingdom of the sun so that we can have a new way of life so that we don't, we no longer need to live according to the uh, old, um, you know, uh, empty way of life that we led earlier. Coming to another verse which talks about um, um, redemption. So we have been redeemed from an empty way of life. What else have we been redeemed from? Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Titus 2, 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless and uh, lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Okay, so he has also redeemed us, you know, released us, set us free for another purpose, uh, uh, to, to set us free from an empty way of life and also to set us free from all lawlessness, all wickedness. And what kind of people are we supposed to be? It's people who are his very own, eager to do what is good. So earlier when we were in the dominion of darkness, there was no real desire to do what is good, what is righteous and holy. But now we have been set free from that empty way of life so that now, we will be eager in the same way we used to be eager for sinful things. Now we are meant to have the same kind of eagerness for godly things. So this whole redemption thing was meant to achieve something more than just setting us free. You see, we are being introduced to a new way of life. And if we don't embrace that new life which is being offered to us, the whole redemption is just wasted. We choose to continue living in the old empty way of life. What has been achieved? What has been accomplished? All we are doing is we are spitting on the one who has redeemed us. And that should, that should not be right. So he has set us free so that we can joyfully get a new start with a clean slate, where we can walk into new things, where we can enjoy an entirely new abundant life that he has for us. That is the whole point of redemption. And if we don't embrace those things and we continue living in the past, it would be a rather pointless thing for us to do. So that is why redemption, the word redemption is used in so many different um, you know, senses to bring out different aspects so that we will actually catch what redemption is uh, really about, what it is meant to accomplish. And so we need to make sure that we are really making use of this redemption that Jesus Christ has done for us. Let's look at one more scripture. Um, Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Galatians 1, 3 and 4. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil is according to the will of our Father, God and Father. One more thing that God has redeemed us from, that he has rescued us from, um, it is the present evil age that we are living in. People who are under the control of the ruler of the air, uh, he can do anything that he wants to to them. You know, he can harm them. Of course, even there, there are limits that God has set. He cannot cross the limits which God has set. But he is able to, you know, um, interfere in their lives to a greater extent. He is able to bring destruction into their lives to a greater extent. But we have been redeemed. We have been redeemed and rescued from this current evil age. So, you know, if you ever find yourself in a time of trial and difficulty where the world is uh, really harming you and your family, you can always go to the scripture and say, Lord, we know that based on scripture, what you have said, you have said that you have rescued us even from this current present evil age that we are living in. So therefore, our Redeemer, Lord, please, you know, Help my family, help me in the situation where this current evil age is attacking me and my family. This is a claim that we can you know, make in front of the Lord because he has made this promise to us that as part of his redemption package, he has also redeemed us from this current evil age. Now, I'm not saying that anything, not, that absolutely nothing bad will ever happen to us. Nor am I saying that, you know, we will not suffer persecution because Jesus Christ himself said that there would be trials and difficulties. But what does he say? He says, take courage because I have overcome the world, he says. So, yes, there would be hardships. 
there would be persecution but the lord says i who have overcome the world i can help you in these things so i will guide you and your family through these situations so his strength will be there his help will be there so these are things that we can actually claim for ourselves um coming to the to one more scripture hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 if someone could read it in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood he himself likewise said in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to one this yeah so um uh oh here again one more different word is used you know in your notes all the greek words are mentioned um so um here uh it talks about how we have been set free how we have been released you know uh from uh from slavery to the fear of death because as long as we were in the dominion of darkness as long as we were slaves of sin uh all we could ever look forward to is physical death and then eternal death in hell but now because of what jesus christ has done we have been set free from death from the fear of death um um so it it says over here it's interesting that it says to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death so it doesn't literally say that we have been delivered from death itself because uh, we all undergo the physical death we all undergo that experience but we don't have to be afraid of that physical death experience simply because there's something even better waiting for us you know beyond death we have eternal life with god so uh, uh it doesn't literally say over here that we have been redeemed from death itself uh but uh, we have been redeemed from the fear of death because physical death can no longer harm us it can no longer you know uh, um take us away from the eternal future which god has for us that is covered that is preserved you know uh, under the lord so we still have Uh, access to eternal life so we don't have to be afraid of death anymore so these are all the different aspects of redemption uh, um, that we need to you know remember so um, that basically you know was just a brief summary of the doctrine of redemption let's in the in the time that we have left um, before the break if we can just quickly get into the doctrine of sanctification okay so now um, when people talk about the salvation experience they talk about initial salvation that's basically when you make a commitment to the lord jesus you choose to submit to him and in that moment regeneration happens uh, redemption happens justification happens all those things take place in that moment of initial salvation and then for the rest of our earthly life we have this ongoing salvation process which we go through which would be sanctification which word where apolitos here apolitos i have an apollo so in my over here um, and i have an apollo trosis over here Lutro and Lut Apollo, are you know basically both from the same root word, where you're not only being purchased, but you're also being set free, being released. Like we use the example of those doves, you purchase them, you set them free from their captivity. Um, uh, I mean, you purchase them and then you release them out into the freedom of something new, you know, where they can fly around and do what they want. And so, uh, so when it, when we apply that to believers, uh, we were now we were earlier we had a former way of life. but now we are being released into a new way of life where we would have liberty in Christ Jesus so it's just basically that so that be apollo apo lutrosis and also that word lutro that's basically the thing um yeah coming back to our sanctification so the sanctification is an ongoing salvation process we had the initial salvation experience now we have the ongoing salvation experience where on a day to day basis sanctification is happening 
what does that mean what exactly is sanctification one verse which tries to bring out the you know um the the two aspects of salvation uh, is hebrews 10:14 so if someone could read out hebrews 10:14 for why one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified so by one offering you know his offering his atoning sacrifice on the cross through one sacrifice he has perfected forever so legally we have been declared as righteous legally we have been justified that is our legal status so it talks about justification the first portion of that verse he has perfected forever that is talking about justification but there's something else which is still going on he has perfected those who are being sanctified so sanctification is still going on justification happened in a single moment where we were legally declared as righteous but the sanctification process is a continual process so basically sanctification is the process which is trying to bring us you know bring our everyday life our thoughts our attitudes it's trying to bring us in line with our legal status because legally status wise we have already been declared justified but in our behavior we are not behaving like justified people we are still living in the old way of life in the empty way of life out of which god redeemed us why did he redeem us he redeemed us so that we can start a new way of life in the kingdom of the sun so we are actually expected to be changing on a daily basis and becoming like this justified person you know who is living in righteousness who is living in holiness so sanctification is basically the process which is trying to bring us in line with our legal status so that not only just status wise are we righteous but even in our actual behavior in our in our thoughts in our attitudes we are growing into this righteousness growing into this legal status which has already been given off to us free you know so um, that is the difference that we see between justification and sanctification and um, your notes has got a very nice table which brings out you know the contrast between justification and sanctification and it's it's quite good actually um, so um, it says over there justification is the legal standing that we have you know the legal standing where we have been declared righteous justified by god sanctification on the other hand has to do with the internal condition so internally am i becoming really righteous am i really growing in holiness that's what sanctification focuses on and then um, justification happens once for all in the sense once you have come under the covering of jesus christ he has declared us justified he has declared us righteous but sanctification is a continual daily process where every day you are becoming more and more righteous and becoming more like christ so one is a once for all experience justification sanctification is, is an ongoing continual process and then it says that justification is entirely god's work which is so true because in that moment when we place our faith in him and submit to him he says yes you know you are now declared just so we didn't do anything from our side except to trust him and it says right even that faith which we we received to trust in him was given by god as a gift we would never have been able to do to trust him on our own so it's entirely god's work justification is entirely god's work but sanctification on a daily basis we have to cooperate with him so god is working in us but we need to cooperate with him and you know be uh, by by choosing to set aside the worldly things and choosing to be godly on a daily basis so here in sanctification we would require active cooperation god god needs our active participation um and then uh, the other point that is made in your notes uh, is that um justification makes us perfect in status only so in st status wise we are declared perfect but it is sanctification which makes sure that we start becoming like christ okay so not only status wise are we perfect but sanctification makes sure that even in our lifestyle we are becoming more and more like christ 
and the last uh, point that is you know mentioned in the table over there in your notes it says the justification is the same for all christians every single person has been declared righteous all are clothed in the righteousness of god so all are equally righteous it's the same uh, status wise we all have been given the righteousness of jesus christ so it's the same for everyone but when it comes to sanctification there are people who have chosen to humble themselves submit to god and actually become more holy in their thoughts in their attitudes in their behavior and there are some who have not even bothered to do that so sanctif the level of sanctification will differ from person to person depending on how much they value what has been given to them and depending on how much they want to take hold of it and actually see it achieved in their lives that will depend on their spiritual hunger that will depend on the on the desire that they have to honor him and be loyal to him so that will differ from person to person um so uh, when we look at sanctification um we could basically say that there are that there are two aspects to it um okay we we'll look at that maybe after we come back from the break so um yeah at 10 o'clock if you know those who are online can log back in we will continue at 10 and i would need someone to help me over here with the camera because half my head was cut off to record